All right, one last example. Let's look at this one together. Um, a body of mass five kilograms is held in equilibrium by two light inextensible strings. Um, so we saw the word light before, which we got again here. Inextensible means they can't stretch. So as soon as you, you know, exceed tension, um, they're just gonna snap basically, um, which is kind of assumed in the last question anyway. One string is attached to a ceiling at A, so that's this one here, and the other to a wall at B. The string attached to the ceiling is at an angle theta, so we can see that marked in to the vertical, and as tension T1 newtons. Okay, that's important, so let's just pop that in. Let's call this one T1. Um, and then the other string is horizontal and it has a tension of T2 newtons. Okay, let's also note that in, so there's that color and this is going off at t2 all right both strings are made of the same material okay so this is slightly different from before um, before you know apparently they were made of different materials so one was strong and the other one had a maximum tension here um, whatever the tension um, can be you know you can subject one rope to the other one is going to be the same okay and we're going to see that later on Part A says, uh, resolve the forces on the body vertically and horizontally and express T1 in terms of theta. Okay, so this question here is kind of scaffolding for you a lot of what we did before kind of instinctively, but um, we can do it nonetheless. Resolve the forces on the body vertically and horizontally. T2 is already resolved. It's already just a simple horizontal force. So I don't need to think about it too much. T1 though, and that's why it's the uh, subject of this question here. T1 I do need to think about. So you can see there's gonna be a vertical component here. And then there's going to be a horizontal component here. And um, the way that I'm gonna do this is the same thing before. I'm gonna create this right angle triangle like so. Um, and I also notice that there's going to be this, uh, you know, this is this five uh, kilogram mass. And so it's being pulled down at a rate of mg, which in this case is 5g. And they haven't uh, given us a value. They haven't specified a value for g just yet. But as you'll see later on in the question, there's some pretty obvious clues that tell us what value for g would be appropriate. Okay, so let's resolve these forces. Now, in much the same way as I did before, I'm gonna use some basic trigonometry here, right? So if that's theta up in this corner, right? What I can say is if I call this x1, cause it's horizontal, and y1, in much the same way that I've done before, you can see that sine of theta is opposite on hypotenuse, it's x1, on T1. So to make X1 the subject, all I need to do is multiply through by T1. So that gives me X1 equals T1 sine theta. Okay. And then using the same kind of logic, I can say over here that Y1 is going to be T1 cos theta. So we saw this earlier on um, by looking at those right angled triangles. Now, which of these is going to be most helpful to me? It says resolve the force on the body vertically and horizontally, express T1 in terms of theta. So I need to be able to use one of these equations in here to get rid of, um, you know, uh, the y1 or the x1, I can make t1 the subject and then the theta will be on the other side. Um, it's going to be another kind of function here. So which one, horizontal or vertical? Now, hopefully you can see, remembering that G, gravity, is just a constant, right? Um, this situation here, vertically, is gonna be the most useful to me because I know what Y1 should be equal to. It should be equal to 5G. I've got this um, up and down that should be in balance. So therefore, well, no, let me carry on my working here. This is part A, part one. What I can say is since it's in equilibrium, um, I can have my vertical, um, which is Y1, being equal to 5 G. So that's the, the only vertical force comes from T1 pulling in the upward direction. So Y1 is T1 cos theta equals 5G. And remembering that 5 is a constant, G is a constant, theta is the only other unknown here. All I have to do is divide through by cos theta, which um, you know I guess I would write as sec theta. That's the reciprocal identity. And that's it. I've just expressed T1 in terms of theta. The rest of that stuff on the right hand side there, it's all constant, five and G. So even though it looks a bit awkward, um, I have done it. T1 in terms of theta. Part two, it says, express T2 in terms of theta. Now, how do I do that? Well, T2 initially doesn't seem to have anything to do with theta. Theta is all the way over here. But just like I equated these vertical forces here, I can do the same thing horizontally. So T2, which is pulling in the right direction, has to be equal to X1, which is 
pulling in the leftward direction. And I already have an expression for that. It's T1 sine theta. So therefore I can say uh, T2 is equal to T1 sine theta. And I already know what T1 is from my earlier part. So I'm just going to substitute that in. That's 5G sec theta times sine theta. It's hanging out the end there. But don't forget, this is uh, sec theta is shorthand for one over cos theta. So this is really sine theta on cos theta, which I can say is just more succinctly tan theta. Um, and that's it. I've expressed T2 T2 in terms of theta. And even though it looks a bit weird, you can see it is exactly paving me a path for the next part of the question. Read along with me, part B. Show that tan theta is less than sec theta for zero is less than theta is less than pi on two. Okay, what's going on here? Well, the first thing is if you just have a think about what tan theta and sec theta look like in the given domain, um, tan theta we're pretty familiar with. It's sort of this graph here and it's sort of, oh, I messed up my, uh, there we go, that's a little better. Got to get my concavity right. Um, that's what tan theta looks like in the um, naught to uh, pi on two range. What does cos theta look, uh, sorry, sec theta look like? It's the reciprocal of cos theta. So given that cos theta looks something like, uh, this is gonna be something like this, you know, it's that it goes down and then sort of going to, um, Actually, it, it actually intersects right there. That's why you have the vertical asymptote. If I think about the reciprocal of this, it's going to, I don't know why I did that in a solid line. Let's make that a bit easier to see. There we go. If you think about the reciprocal, it's going to look like this, right? Now, the question is like, oh, do they ever cross, right? And the answer is no in this domain, but how can I prove that? Okay, uh, there's a bunch of ways to do this, but um, a pretty quick and dirty way to do it, and we only need one mark's worth of um, explanation for this anyway, is actually just to start with the domain that they provide to us, right? So what I've got here is uh, zero is less than theta is less than pi on two. So what I've got is acute angles. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to just take sine um, of everything because what that will give me is a restriction in between um, uh, you can see here between naught and pi on two that I am aware of. So I can say sine of zero is less than sine of theta, which is less than sine of pi on two. So that's all fine. Um, and I can evaluate this, of course, zero is less than sine theta is less than one, which of course you could state just from um, the, you know, the range of sine, but this way I got it straight from what the question provided me. And then I can say, but, because I'm trying to get a relationship between tan theta and sec theta, right? And I almost have tan theta and sec theta appearing in this inequality. All I need to do is if you have a look at these two terms, there's just a division through by cosine that's required, right? Now you can't just divide through by things in an inequality. You can in an equation, but in an equality you have to be careful because if you divide through by something negative, it changes the directions of your inequality signs. But not in this case because I have this particular domain restriction, right? So I can say, in this domain, when you've got uh, theta being acute, cos theta is always positive, right? Um, I sort of illustrated it just over here. Here it is, it's always above the axis. I'm not even including this endpoint, right? So it can't even be equal to zero. So therefore, I can divide through and it preserves my, uh, all the directions of my inequalities, they're all fine, right? So therefore, I'm gonna go zero over um, cos theta is less than sine theta on cos theta, and that's less than one on, whoopsie daisy, getting ahead of myself, about to write sec, uh, one on cos theta. So it's important, I've stated that I'm dividing through by a positive thing, so all of my, my inequalities remain in the same direction that they were before. Okay, here we go, I'm almost there. Um, zero divided by anything is, is just zero. Um, what have I got in the middle? I've got tan theta. And then what have I got on the right hand side? Sec theta, which if you have a look back at the original question, this is exactly what I wanted. In fact, I didn't really even need that zero, right? I've got tan theta is less than sec theta. I'm just gonna say that. Therefore, tan theta is less than sec theta as required in the given domain anyway. Okay, and that pays the way for part C. Let's read it together. There's a bit of text here. The type of string used will break if it is subjected to a tension of more than 98 newtons. 
find the maximum allowable value of theta so that neither string will break. So this seems familiar, right? This is just like the previous question in that I'm trying to, I know a maximum tension. Uh, and then what I want to find is what's the uh, maximum allowable value of something before um, the strings will break. The difference is here, um, I know what the mass of this object is. It wasn't like I have a flower pot and like how heavy a flower can I put in it, a plant I can put in it. I've got a body that has a known mass, it's five kilograms. What's unknown is this value of theta. So you can see as theta varies, um, it's going to, you know, if I had a, a larger value of theta, then that first string is going to be pulling more in a horizontal direction, okay? Whereas if I have a smaller value of theta, it's going to be sort of down this way. So um, T1 is going to be pulling more vertically than it is horizontally. Okay, so what I'm setting out to do is to maximize theta. How do I do that? Well, the first thing to think about is I've got two strings, right? I've got T1 and T2, or the string to A, the string to B. But part B has given us a clue that tells us which of the strings is more important, which one is bearing more of the load. Um, maybe some of your intuition tells you which one is the most important, but we can actually do this algebraically. Show that tan theta is less than sec theta. We've done that. And so therefore I can say, um, if, you know, I'm just gonna carry on from part B, if this is true here, then I can multiply through by 5G because five is a positive constant and G is a positive constant. Now, the reason why this is useful is because one of these is T1 and one of them is T2, right? Uh, go and have a look back. You can see here's T1, it's the sec theta term, and here's T2, it's the tan theta term, right? So what I've got here, therefore, is that T2 is less than T1. So no matter what kind of arrangement you have, T1, which is the one pulling upwards, it's always going to be bearing more of the load than T2. That's what it means for it to have greater tension than the other one. So all of this just to say, I can pretty much ignore T2. If, if it got to you know, that maximum tension, 98 newtons, I think it said, if it got to 98 newtons, well, T1 would have more than 98 newtons, so it already broke a while ago, right? So therefore, this is why, this is my reasoning for um, ignoring T2. So I can say, um, therefore, we can disregard T2 and just focus on T1. We can disregard T2. All right. So from here, what I want to say is, well, if T1, T1 is equal to 5G sec theta, but what I'm trying to do is maximize it, right? So the largest that T1 can get is 98. So therefore, uh, sorry, did I say that right? Yes, 98. It's 98. And that's equal to, here's my expression for T1. And what I'm trying to do is solve for theta. Now, at this point, you might remember, um, we weren't specified a value for G, right? And it sort of flopped back and forth between uh, 10 meters per second per second or 9.8. Uh, when you see something like 98 or 980 or 9,800, that's kind of your dead giveaway that what they want you to do, even if not stated, is let or assume G equals 9.8, because otherwise there's not really much of a point to pick such an obtuse number. Um, in much the same way, if they'd let that equal to 100, that's an equal clue that um, they want you to let G equals 10. Okay, so if I have that, what I've got is 98 equals five times 9.8 times sec theta. And I might as well actually write that in as one over cos theta. Okay, now at this point, what am I going to do? Well, um, I can see that um, if I multiply both sides by cos theta, I get cos theta over here. And then if I divide both sides by 98, that turns 9.8 divided by 98 into one over 10. So I'm getting five over 10. Five over 10, last I checked, was a half. Now, don't forget, because I am now trying to solve a trigonometric equation, I need a domain. Thankfully, I already have a domain restriction provided to me in the question. You can see um, this theta here has to exist in this right angle triangle. Um, part B told me that it had to be acute. So I can say off of that, it's only going to be one solution to cos theta equals a half. In this domain, it's going to be 60 degrees for naught is less than theta is less than pi on two. So this is it. When theta hits 60 degrees, you hit 98 newtons in T1 and you can't go any further. Um, if you were to, if you have a think about it, right? Um, having a larger value here, as theta gets bigger, as it gets closer and closer to 90 degrees, what does it do to cos theta? And the answer is uh, it decreases, right? So the bigger it gets, the, the more this angle, let's actually, um, if I put something in here like so, 
Mm, give me a straight line, please. Notability. That's better. Maybe I'll make it a bit thicker so it's more obvious. Oh, I'm making a mess of this, aren't I? Let's put it over here and then I can fiddle with it. Okay, there we go. So let's call this T1, right? Now, as the angle is going to increase, which is something like, you know, imagine if it was going off in this direction, you can see how theta is getting bigger and bigger. Um, as theta gets bigger, um, you know, the tension you can see here, it's getting smaller and smaller. And that's because um, this rope over here is going to be bearing more of that weight. Um, whereas if theta was getting smaller and smaller, so let's bring back this over in this direction, you can see it's going to be bearing more of the force. Once you pass 60 degrees, it's game over, you exceed 98 Newtons because the, the smaller the angle gets, you can see as I go over to the left here, because this indeed is the theta axis, uh, axis um, you get a larger and larger value for cos theta, so uh, therefore you've got this problem happening here. Although I do notice actually, it's over, actually one over cos theta, so everything I just said I think is reversed because it's an inverse relationship. All right, so I hope that makes sense. You can think about the fact that um, you've got these situations where you've got all the different concurrent forces acting, all the different angles. Um, the key things are that you wanna make sure you resolve your forces neatly, um, draw your diagrams so you can see the triangles clearly and do your trigonometric reasoning like this in a really obvious way. And um, don't forget to include like these really little steps of reason, these important steps of reasoning a little, um, but they say a lot in um, how you're trying to explain and justify your answer. So make sure you include those.